So, colleagues, friends, uh, perhaps somebody can be surprised that I'm starting a presentation about the wilderness in the Czech Republic by a painting by the famous German painter Gospodary Friedrich. But this is really from the present day territory of the Czech Republic. This is the Rosenberg Hill, the highest point of our national park in Switzerland. And I think it's a very nice romantic wilderness picture now in Essen in New Zealand. So there are quite many various international frameworks dealing with uh, wilderness protection in, in Europe. There's IOCN with the guidelines, categories. Uh, we have here La Duventura from the European Wilderness Society. And there's also but about Europe that uh, initiated together with the Czech Republic probably the first European wilderness conference in 2009 in the framework of the Czech EU presidency, at the time opened by the former president Martha Hauer. And I mentioned this conference because this conference brought some important results that actually we can distinguish three different pillars of wilderness areas in Europe. It means not only the really pristine areas such as uh, Carpathians in Romania or the formerly modified landscape, but now non-interventional non areas such as Hawaii Forest or Shumawa National Park, but also typical restoration areas. And this is also the case of my Bohemian system National Park. And it means that when I will talk about the wilderness, I will use this term always in a significantly broader uh, meaning sense than just the IUCN category 1B. Of course, the IUCN guidelines and categories are very important for us, not only the guidelines from 2008, but also the recent uh, guidelines from last year about the management of IUCN category uh, 1B. And uh, when I'm already mentioning some literature, of course, essential are also guidelines on wilderness in Natura 2000 sites uh, published by the European Commission. But I have to say that my talk is uh, mostly influenced by this wonderful book published in the United States in 2010 with the uh, title Beyond Naturalness and subtitle Resting King Park in Wilderness, the Worship, the Worship in an era of rapid change. And when I read this book, I realized that uh, many uh, dilemmas, uh, problems, trade-offs uh, related to, to wilderness that seemed for me to be very difficult are actually even more difficult than I thought. Yes, this book is based on, the, on criticism on, on the limits of naturalist concept. As we know, the naturalist concept appears a guiding concept throughout the protective area policy through the whole 20th century, actually. But this concept is related to many dilemmas and limits. For instance, in the United States, very favorite discussion about the influence by indigenous populations. Is it part of nature? nature or not? But I think the, the, the main the uh, problem is actually connected with the, with the rise of non equilibrium dynamics in, in modern ecology and with the, with the whole shift from the concept of nature balance to the concept, uh, to the flux of nature. We know that deterministic models are too simple to describe the complexity of nature dynamics and then stochastic processes such as charge, events, accidents and so on then can play a really crucial role. And therefore, sometimes there is a really fundamental question if we are able to define what is actually natural. And uh, as we can say that the concept of naturalness does not provide really sufficient guidance for wilderness stewardship. Because anthropogen anthropogenic change is increasing and the managers who are responsible for wilderness 
and we must decide sometimes whether to respond to such changes by intervening in ecosystem processes or not. And therefore, there are quite many different wilderness approaches. And also, there is a substantial overlap among these approaches. Each differs in its central emphasis. I will mention actually only two, two different approaches uh, representing, let's say, extremes or two poles. One is the historical fidelity approach, <coughs> based on the natural heritage, very close to the naturalness concept. And there are several activities that are typical for such an approach. One can be the effort to restore altered ecosystems. Of course, usually it's only approximation. But the restoration brings always also question challenges. If, if yes, restoration then is a question to which period. For instance, Aldo Leopold recommended that the goal of such intervention should be recreate the ecological scene as seen by the first European visitors, which is not realistic. There are problems with historical data because of incompleteness and because of the time and space scale dependence of these data. Another was a very typical activity in this framework of this approach is the, is the effort to eradicate or at least to control non-native invasive species. In our park in Bohemia and Switzerland, we have very good examples of the white pine invasion, the German Weimund Skifers, an American pine, very strong invasion, and also with other invasive species such as fallopia species or invasive glandulifer. And again, this brings many challenges because uh, one reason is that we started with the eradication quite, quite late. So and the, and the species was already established quite firmly in, in the national park. And this brings not only technical and financial challenges, but also the question of the acceptance by general public and by visitors, because we are eradicating this uh, invasive pine not only in management zones, but also in the core zones of the national park. And when you see this map of distribution of this invasive pine, you can, you can imagine the scope of the problem within the national park. Another challenge is the transboundary management of invasive species. For instance, regarding this invasive plant, in Patsyat glandulifera, we are quite consistent with the eradication on the Czech side of the national park, while our colleagues in Germany, use, I would say, another framework, not only technically, but let's say philosophical framework to this problem. Another issue, very typical for this historical approach, that we try to reintroduce some regionally extinct species. For instance, in our national park, we succeeded, together with the German colleagues, to bring back uh, Perakai Falcon, and the salmon, and we plan to, to bring back and reintroduce other species such, such as the hazel crows or capricorn, perhaps, in the future. <coughs> but again, when we, when we are dealing with, with species reintroduction, this uh, brings further questions. For instance, are we allowed to simulate or to substitute some uh, missing species or other no longer acting ecological drivers in the area. For instance, regarding hunting in the national parks or the wilderness areas, uh, this simulation, in this case of missing predators, is very, very often used as an argumentation by the, by the hunting also in the national parks. But I know that in this case, some biologists uh, ask or raise the question, if you are allowed to simulate missing predators, 
biotechnics, biogas, various but you are not allowed to simulate missing large heterogs such as Oros from this round by other techniques, or to slide or something like that. What is the difference? And actual file management is also part of this concept. This is one of the key, key ecological uh, factors that we have today uh, in our protected areas. Uh, under control. When I visited the Blue Mountains National Parks in, in Australia, I asked the managers about this topic and they explained to me that they apply fire management strategy not only in the National Park Category 2 but also in the wilderness area. I would say Category 1B, they apply classical fire management. We had such a very nice fire ten years ago in our national park. You can compare the pictures now and ten years ago. It's a non-intervention part of the national park now. But again, this raises the question, can we actually speak about the natural process? Or in other words, what is the sense of a non-intervention regime when we are controlling fires in our national parks? in an area that we know, based on anthropological, uh, anthro anthropological data, uh, where we know that actual fires were the key ecological driver in these ecosystems. And then there is the opposite approach, the so-called hands-off approach, or intervention approach. Just leaving nature alone, having no care actually on single species habitat types, on the spreading of invasive species, just preserving wilderness by restraining direct interventions. And this is an approach well fitted to the purpose of nature's autonomy. And a big advantage of this approach is that this approach actually doesn't have any, a problem with these trade-offs because it's quite easy to be consistent within this approach. <clears throat> it's also a very strong concept for promoting supportive nature processes based on cyclic succession, just to, as, as for instance, the bark beetle outbreak. Everybody knows this picture from Pravarian Forest and the Shumova National Park. But of course, this approach has also uh, its limits. There are many external interventions. Some of them can be even stronger than the direct interventions. This can uh, approach lead to completely non-natural ecosystem types. So we are, if we are not controlling invasive species at all, uh, then it is question if, if such an approach is really protecting natural processes. And actually in a long-term perspective, in some areas, can be also harmful to native species and paradoxically, gardens area can become, in a long-term perspective, center for spreading of invasive species. So we can come to the situation in long term that perhaps we will have in such areas more invasive species than in the surrounding cultural landscape. And we can ask, ask if this was actually the primary objective of these wilderness areas. And therefore, I think such an approach is more feasible in large and remote areas and is least appropriate in areas where active management is needed for protection and maintenance of species and or habitats, especially threatened species. Sometimes we can hear about the so-called ecological integrity approach, integrating or combining somehow these two approaches with non-intervention and active management. But what is quite important is to say that all these approaches have trade limits, barriers and trade-offs. The question might be if the IUCN guidelines are helpful when we are dealing with these dilemmas and trade-offs. If you look into the IUCN guidelines from 2008, it's quite important to note that, for instance, 
regarding category 2 national park, the primary objective is to protect natural biodiversity, of course, along the ecostructure and environment processes. But I think it's quite important to note that this category is, or the end of this category is to protect natural biodiversity. Because sometimes we tend to think uh, that uh, natural, national parks are only about the ecological processes. But the base is natural biodiversity, of course, by help of the ecological processes, but natural biodiversity. So I think that really national parks should not suffer from, from, from invasive species. About the concrete problem of non-native species, in category two, there is one sentence that the national park should be actually established in areas with relatively low risk of successful invasion by non-native species. Which is, I think, uh, guidance that, that is not applicable in the practice. Because you cannot predict if, if an area will be, will be invited by, by, by non-native species in the future. Of course, there are some general trends or general guidance on the skies, mountain species, mountain areas are always less sensitive to uh, biological invasions than food starts, Mediterranean regions, but <coughs> this is not helpful in this case. And then uh, very often there is a rule or, or guidance that all this restoration in, in parks and boundaries areas should be limited in space and time, which is basically reasonable, but in case in case of invasive species, again, this is not applicable. Our experience, and not only from our national park, but from all sides, where is, where is the management of invasive species, is the experience that once you begin to control invasive species, you have to do this actually for forever. Otherwise, it has no sense. Uh, this is also an, a favorite topic of our discussion our colleagues from Saxon Switzerland National Park who accept the, the eradication of invasive species in the management zones but not in the core zones. But uh, we argue that in this case we, we, the, 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 the invasive species will come back again from out the area outside to, to our national park. And regarding wilderness uh, areas, there is in the two, 2008 guidelines, there is a guidance or rule that removal of invasive species is not usually suitable in strictly protected areas, uh, category 1A and 1B. But if you look on the recent guidelines, 2016, there is quite clear sentence that managers should be aware of the potential problems posed by alien and invasive species and take action to protect indigenous species wherever possible. So there is quite a clear shift uh, accepting the growing danger by invasive species also to parallel areas. So I'm coming slowly to conclusions. I would say that there are actually two basic approaches. Uh, we can protect wilderness and natural processes itself, it means as a conservation goal. In this case, the whole protected areas or wilderness areas is something like a large experimental observation plot. Or we can, we can protect wilderness and natural processes as a tool to protect our ecosystems and their biodiversity. And somebody perhaps can argue that this is the same, but I think it is the same just in the short term perspective, not in the long term. Just an example, as everybody knows, it's the unique Alto Alpine tundra of Kirkonoshe Mountains. Uh, this is, in fact, also a uh, non intervention zone where we are dealing with natural processes. But I think that Ernst Luther from, from Kirkonoshe will agree that nobody can say in this case that we are dealing here just. Is natural process. 
and not with the species. The opposite the species are here extremely important. We have here many endemic species, glacier lake species. So this is the, the, the second case when we are actually protecting this diversity through the boundaries approach or non-intervention regime because uh, the presence of this species here is a result of natural process in the past and we think that <coughs> under current conditions and under current climate the non-intervention regime is also the best way how to protect this species and the biodiversity. Of course in the future when it starts with some climatic changes uh, it can happen that there will be a new dilemma for, 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 for nature conservation how to protect biodiversity. And uh, therefore, I think basically there are two, two approaches. One is focusing on the heritage, on what we already have in our protected areas, including diversity species and so on. And then there is the hands off approach, just looking for the future. And I think the assigning from species conservation accepting invasive species and so on. But I think that actually in no wilderness area or park in Europe we are really on this extreme pause of this axis. So we are somewhere here and of course there are different approaches in different parks and there are also different approaches in different countries. So based on our very good cooperation with our German colleagues in Saxon, Bohemia and Switzerland I think I can say quite clearly that, for instance, our German colleagues are with their approach uh, significantly closer to this wall than we are in our part. And uh, I mentioned the problem of invasive species only for several times, so somebody could, could think that I'm somehow possessed with this team, invasive species in wilderness areas, but I think in this case actually the approach of the management or non-management of invasive species is a good litmus paper to, to indicate where we are actually on this hypothetical axis. And I think that the, the, the whole problem of this uh, dilemmas and trace of we are, we, we are dealing with, uh, in our European protected areas, in wilderness area, areas, is connected with the fact that we are actually combining these two approaches together. <coughs> we mix them together. So on one side, we restore some parts of parts. We bring some extinct species back. We, we are trying to, to, to stop some native species, but, which is typically brought for this historical fidelity or naturalist approach. At the same time, we have quite large non intervention zones, but also in, in, in parts of the landscape that are quite heavy, quite strongly modified, which is a typical approach for this hands off approach. But uh, to be clear, I'm not criticizing this, that we are not consistent and that we are combining both approaches. I, think, I even think that this is actually the only responsible approach. For, for our wilderness areas that are always uh, a mosaic or a combination of this old nature of our heritage, of this, some remnant of Christian politics, <coughs> and on, of uh, other parts of the park uh, where we have the potential to restore something. And uh, so for this, for this I, uh, I use the term old wilderness. In contrast, in other parts or other regions, we use the term sometimes new wilderness. It might, it might be post mining sites or poor industrial sites. I think such, such sites are very, very suitable for really fundamental uh, application of the hands off approach, including invasive species, because there is usually no threat to, to, to native biodiversity. And you can also observe the, 
secondary succession really from the zero point. And now the final conclusions. I uh, think that we cannot simply cross off paths and do this just by drawing a line, a line around them and leaving them alone. It is becoming increasingly clear that no single management approach can preserve the full range of wilderness workers and values, and therefore some trade-offs are always necessary. <coughs> and however, the bad managers have often the feeling, or they often find that they are bad <coughs> if they do intervene, and then if they don't, sometimes both approach is controversial. And therefore, I think that managers should focus on outcomes and specific conservation goals, rather than on the question whether this change is caused by humans or not. So key is really the conservation objective. And uh, we should be also able to change the management approaches in the future if it is necessary. For instance, it can happen that even in a non-intervention zone, uh, really certain, extremely certain species will, will appear and perhaps it will be necessary. That will require some management and perhaps it will be quite reasonable to change the approach for the specific laws. So, uh, this is actually the principle of the adaptive management. So I think that uh, it's all, it's full respect to IUCN criteria, guidelines, and rules for wilderness and so on. I think that all these, uh, all these principles and rules are actually just tools. And we should not, we should not substitute tools for real conservation laws. So, uh, for instance, if somebody says that I think we should intervene here, but we cannot, can you, cannot intervene because we are in category two or one or such a zone, and we have to be consistent. This is not a good argument from my, from my perspective. So I think uh, we should avoid, avoid any, let's say, formalism, fundamentalism, simplification, and uh, in other words, we should have also the courage to change our approaches and not to be always 100% consistent. If we really think that uh, this is necessary and this is reasonable in the new situation at the concrete site and in, in, in the concrete time. That's all. Thank you. <laughs>
I think Zinka, what is important is that, uh, that uh, the, the, this, these guidelines published and approved by the Hawaii Congress really recommend to intervene if you see that invasive species are somehow affected the area. Of course, it's, it should be minimal, but it's a really different, it, it's, a, it's a shift from the approach to do nothing, to do something. Yeah. I think the important point here is that they call this minimum requirement decision guidelines. In American wilderness areas, these are absolutely essential guidelines where you have where you make a trade of does it harm the objectives of the area or does it not harm them? I think if you take that seriously, yeah, you very often will come up with the decision not to not to fight the message. I understand the problem, but but uh, I am very glad for this presentation because this is a very, very complex and difficult issue what we are now facing on. One way it's a guidelines and tools what we are getting from IUCN level, Europe or whatever. But once we get to the field, and it was very nicely to see from your presentation, when you go to the field, these tools are nice to have somewhere in the background, but to make the concrete decision trade-off, as you said. But then we have to be very, very careful how we are going to misuse or not misuse this tool, because that's a risk. That's a risk of what happens always when Tatra National Park is going to clear cut because of barbecue, just because of scale, because foresters was not used for clear cut or, or impact of the of, of the IPS typography in such a large scale. That's a day personal experience. It was in that time maximum 10, 15 hectares and suddenly 300 hectares, even more. So the trade-off is obviously partially solutions for this kind of cases in a in real practical life, but also risk because it can be easily misused by the owners, politicians, decision makers, etc., etc. And therefore, it would be very nice to have at least a handful of the wilderness area where we do nothing. Because we need these etalons, we need these models. Even if barbital eat all spruce forests in one valley of Tatra, for example, it is not going to die. Something else going to happen there. With the invasive species, it's more tricky. Yeah. It's more difficult. But then the questions come into our mind, because we are facing to the situation almost every day. How long we as a society are able to fight against that spe or not the in invasive species, that invasive species, especially now when the climate is going to change and it's changing. It is going to be never-ending process management, and it, again, trade-off. Okay.